Hello there. Welcome. My name is Steve Carter. I'm speaking for Bethel Baptist Church on May the 31st, which in the church calendar is known as Pentecost. We've had a recent Bank Holiday Monday and uh, Pentecost is better known by the term Whit Sunday. Traditionally, it was when many who committed themselves to Jesus Christ followed in the waters of baptism were dressed in white and that became synonymous with White Sunday, Whit Sunday, synonymous with the time recorded in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit was poured out in great power at Pentecost. I've been asked if I would address this subject of the Holy Spirit as we coincide with Pentecost. And my thoughts were led to part of John's Gospel, chapter 14. And so let's, without further ado, read just a short section of this marvellous chapter. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Jesus is in the upper room speaking to his disciples. Let's hear the word of God. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me any more, but you will see me. And because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Let's ask God's blessing upon his word. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes and by your Holy Spirit enable us to see the wonderful truth in your word. We thank you for one another as a fellowship we thank you for the love that binds us together. We pray again for each other. For those who are finding the lockdown difficult, especially, we commend them to your care. And we pray that the ministry of the Holy Spirit, bringing Christ to their hearts and the word of God to their minds, might strengthen them and encourage them. We pray, Lord, for all in the government, and opposition and the health workers at every level. We pray, Lord, as we thank you for them, that you will continue to help them. And we pray especially for the research into a vaccine to help cope with this virus. We commend to you all who mourn because of loss. And we pray, Lord, for our whole nation, that at this time, as we are seeing evidence of, Many will see how materialism alone cannot help, that we have a short life. And the most important thing is to know you, whom is eternal life. So pour out your spirit and help us now. We thank you for your promise that those who seek you shall find you if they seek you with all their heart. Enable us to be such seekers for Jesus' sake we ask. Amen. How easy is it for you to say goodbye? As I thought of that in connection with John 14, from verse 15 onwards, and you'll see the connection shortly, my mind went back to 
Linda, my wife, and the first day of Rebecca going to school. Now, in those days, there was no sort of easing the children in. It was a case of the big day when having had your children at home uh, coming to about five years of age, off they went to school. And Linda, as I expected, wasn't there just for 10 minutes. She was there for about an hour and a half. And uh, when she came back, she said, well, I spent most of the time not able to deal with my own sense of loss, but talking and counselling other young mums and having coffee together as we all sought to come to terms with losing, just for a few hours, our children. But it was a big thing, saying goodbye to your child at the school gate. Of course, come three o'clock, there was hugs and returns home. And then my mind also came to a TV series some years ago uh, called Band of Brothers, about this American company uh, got involved in the Allies' fight against Nazi Germany, and you saw them in Europe, and you saw how these men bonded together, and yet how partings came, the parting of death, as one soldier would hold another, as the other soldier eventually breed their last. Partings, the distress of partings, saying goodbyes. And that's what's happening in John's Gospel, chapter 14. The Lord Jesus Christ is part of that band of brothers. For over three years, Peter and James and John and uh, others uh, have bonded with Jesus. He's their leader. They've grown to love him, to say that no man spoke like this man. And now Jesus has said he's leaving them and they won't see him uh, for some time. And they're in distress. Jesus begins to comfort them. John 14, 1, the comfort that I'm going actually to prepare a place for you in heaven. But when we come to the second part of the chapter, the second ground of comfort is that though Jesus is going away, he's going to give the Holy Spirit. Now, 50 days after uh, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came in Pentecostal power. And Acts 2 records that. What we're doing on this Pentecost Sunday is looking at the promise that was fulfilled at Pentecost and see, I trust, the parallels between what Jesus promises and what was fulfilled. So we're going to just look at two questions. We're going to look at the question primarily uh, concerning who is the Holy Spirit? Who is it that comes in Acts 2? Who is it that Jesus promises? Who is it that believers uh, receive? So who is coming at Pentecost? And then secondly, how does he come to me? What do I have to do to know the blessed Holy Spirit? Now I remind you uh, that there's much in this chapter that we cannot deal with, sadly, because of time. I am determined to try and finish this sermon in 35 minutes. So the clock is ticking. So let's go. Verses 15 and 16 to begin. How do we, re uh, sorry, what do we receive in the receiving of the Holy Spirit? Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Notice the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father. And later on, Jesus says he's sending him. So the Holy Spirit comes by the Father and the Son. Notice that the scripture teaches the Holy Spirit is a person. We're told that do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. You can't grieve an it, but you can 
grieve a him or a her. We're told the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, Peter says to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 6, you've not lied to men, but you've lied to God in resisting the Holy Spirit. There's much then that I'm assuming that you grasp of this. But who is coming then? The first thing that we receive, the Holy Spirit, is an advocate. Verse 15, sorry, verse 16, I'll ask the Father, he'll give you another advocate. Now, I'm no Greek, Greek scholar, but I do know the word, and you've probably heard it before. Advocate is the translation of the Greek word parakletos. And if you know that, you'll know by looking at different Bible versions that maybe your version didn't have advocate. Maybe it had comforter. Maybe it had helper. Uh, there are many valid definitions of this rich word parakletos. We're going to focus on advocate, but I must touch on the others. The word parakletos is sometimes translated um, counsellor, a counsellor. Now, I know, you know, there are people who go in for counselling and they charge exorbitant fees. I'm not saying there shouldn't be any charge. But you hear of these celebrities and they've, they've had years of counselling and spent thousands of pounds. He is the Holy Spirit who comes absolutely freely to counsel. And how does he counsel? Through the word. And what is one of the great books in the Bible to counsellors? The book of Proverbs. Young people especially. I was exhorted when I came to faith as a 16 year old. Um, a chapter a day, counselling how to avoid immorality and the chaos and pain it causes. Uh, how to be uh, a good host, how to be a good neighbour, how to avoid getting involved with the wrong crowd, uh, how to avoid a thousand cuts and pain and scars. The Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, counsels you to be wise. And those of us, as we get older, we need this counsel, don't we? The Holy Spirit comes as a counsellor. But then the Holy Spirit comes as a comforter. That may, might be the translation in your Bible. The comforter. The great joy of having the comforter. You wake at two or three in the morning and all the problems, uh, some of which will never materialise, but they're weighing on your mind, come to you. Call upon the comforter. Remind yourself of the promises of God. Uh, the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, into him, and find refuge. If God be for us, who can be against us? The great comforter. Now, the other day I listened to uh, the uh, apologist, uh, great preacher, evangelist, Ravi Zacharias. And he told a, a, a lovely story, a moving story. They have a an outlet of their mission in New York amongst youngsters who have been cast onto the street. They, they, they service some 150 children, providing food, a kind of orphanage and education. And every day there are these sad young people coming in, little to teenagers. And this little girl came in and she'd hardly speak. But she had a tin can that she was always holding. It was a paint can. And wherever she went, if she had a shower, she made sure it was just near her, not getting wet, but uh, she could keep her eye on it. And gradually over the weeks, uh, one of the helpers got to know this little girl and one morning made a point of bumping into her on the way to breakfast, said, shall we sit together? And uh, eventually, as they're having some donuts and a drink together, summoned up the courage to say, what's in that can? It was a tin can and it was a paint can disused. And she said, my mother, there were the ashes of a mother. 
the story was that as a young girl, barely a week old, her mother dumped her. She grew up on the streets, taken into care, out of care, and I think she was about 11 years of age at this time, and she hated her mother. But just a month or so earlier, before she came into this uh, setup, she she got news of her mother who was dying of AIDS. So she she went to see her mother at her mother's request. And her mother, frail, said, look, I always loved you. I'm sorry about what happened. And I don't make any excuses, but I loved you and I still love you. Within a couple of days, the mother died and the little girl asked for the ashes. And like a little girl would hug a teddy bear, this little girl hugged this disused tin of paint containing her mother's ashes. I don't know what you think of that, but I find that very touching. What touched her was that after years of misunderstanding and, and right reactions having been dumped, she learnt her mother loved her. That was her great comfort. Most of us, our children haven't thankfully had to go through that. They've had a comforter, they've had a teddy, they've had a, a soft tortoise, they, they've had something, a comfort blanket. My friend, whatever you're going through, however wretched your background has been, however cast off by others, God is a comforter and he sent his Holy Spirit to touch your heart, touch your emotions, to heal them. What happens when the Holy Spirit comes? He comes as a comforter. He comes as a helper. That's another translation of parakletos. And how wonderful it is. You, you begin a day and maybe you've had a difficult night, but you remind yourself, God is my helper. I will not be ashamed. I will not be afraid. He will help me to cope with the day. He will help me to forgive others who have treated me wrongly. He will help me to do acts of compassion. I will ring that fellow church member. I will ring uh, that person who's on their own during the lockdown. Uh, I will fawn and, and encourage them. He will help me. There are things that are difficult to do. Lord, help me. I hope it's your testimony as it is mine that instead of curling up in a little ball and life has become too difficult for us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Holy Spirit has come and enabled me. But then there is this translation we all rejoice in, is that he is our advocate. Now in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And, and we rejoice in that. But just notice this, the Lord Jesus is described in 1 John as an advocate. The Holy Spirit is described by the Lord Jesus as an advocate. Uh, he will give you another advocate. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to go, there's going to be a parting, but another of the same kind as me is going to come. That's why we say the Holy Spirit is divine. He is another like Jesus. He is another of equal divinity to Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what does he come to do? He comes to defend us in a court of law. Now, there's a couple of times I've had to go to court. They've uh, yet to catch up with me. So these times I went as, as a witness and even that was intimidating. As you see these people so articulate and as you listen to them, you realize they can, if they want, make black sound white and white sound black. The most infuriating people, aren't they? You know, they, they, they will not admit if they're wrong. Well, here we are. We're poor sinners by nature and by choice. And it was Paul Tunier, a Christian consultant, 
uh, of an earlier age, you said that guilt is a universal phenomenon. Guilt is a universal phenomenon. And um, what do we do with our guilt? We don't deny it, though many try do. Uh, we don't try and excuse it. No, we recognize it. And we go to the one who can uh, defend us against it. And so the Holy Spirit comes. Every time that you conscience attacks, then you're able to look to your advocate. The Lord Jesus at the right hand of the Father, the Holy Spirit turns you to him. He pleads the merit of his death. And you're able to rejoice that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's been set in stone. No one, but no one, can bring a legitimate charge against those who have repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what, what is it? Romans 8 and verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has justified? whom God has chosen. It is God who justifies. End of argument. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is coming to be, yes, our helper, to be our comforter, to be our counsellor, but supremely to be our advocate, to defend us. Let me just extend it in terms of another verse in the Bible, Joel 2, verse 25. There we read uh, that God will restore the years that have been wasted. Joel 2.25, I'll repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young lotus, locust, uh, my great army that I've sent among you. You'll have plenty then to eat until you're full. You will praise the name of the Lord your God who's worked wonders for you. What is one of the things, one of the shall I say, sins that can bug us and one of the things that Satan will use to depress God's children. It is regret. We've wasted so much time. I've spoken to those who have come to faith in older age. Why did I leave it so long? The promise is God can yet restore and make those last few years abundant and fruitful. And I was reading a magazine called The Oldie, and I've taken out a subscription, special offer, 12 issues, each one a month for £12. And uh, we'll see how we get on. Fascinating articles by older people, celebrities, so-called writers. And on the problem page, yes, they have a problem page for old people, is this question, how can I get rid of my regret? And the deep lament of people in their 70s and I just look back on my life and I have deep regret. Maybe you feel like that. I felt like that as a child of God. If only I'd done this. If only I'd not done that. If only I'd had a bit more sense to withdraw from that situation. Regret. And it can weigh so heavily. Virginia Ironside, the, the agony ant, just confirm that there are people worldwide. It's, it's, it's not just a few who are taken up with regret. And that's why I just apply it to this area. If you face regret, you know, you can come to God with it, repent of it, but don't let it drag you down in the present, forgetting the past, pressing on to the great prize that is yours as a believer in Christ Jesus. Moving on, who do we receive as we receive the Holy Spirit? We receive the Advocate. We receive the truth. Secondly, we receive the truth because verse 17, John 14, uh, the Advocate will help you be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. What is truth, said Pilate? We live in a day when people say, that's your truth, believe in Christianity, Steve, but I'll believe in my truth. As if you can have uh, opposing truths. You can't. The Bible is telling us there's one truth. 
And we see that in other areas. Uh, when we get into a plane and we're 50, 60,000 feet above, we all believe in the truth of gravity. If you, if you dare get out the plane, down you go. We all believe that two and two makes four. And Jesus came and said, look, I am the way, the truth and the life. And his truth is verifiable uh, through archaeology. It's verifiable from a manuscript point of view. And then the question asks, well, Steve, you know, surely the, the people who wrote uh, what was going on, surely they made mistakes. Surely. Well, first of all, you'll admit with me, here are eyewitnesses who are writing about these things. Uh, that which we've touched and seen and heard, that we declare to you. But, but here we have this added uh, knowledge. What is the Holy Spirit going to do? Well, we just move beyond our passage to verse 26. Uh, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. He will teach them. So there's this unique operation of the Holy Spirit that they did recall without error alongside their own research. So chapter 16 and verse 13 says the same thing. Jesus, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all the truth. So I am very confident that when I believe the Bible and rightly understood, understand the interpretation of it, I'm believing the truth. The Holy Spirit comes. You need have no lack of confidence. You're called upon to believe the truth. And the Holy Spirit, when he works, brings that conviction. All the doubts that we might have had and the legitimate research into uh, the truthfulness and reliability of the Bible, all those go, finally, when the Holy Spirit comes to confirm the truth. Many years ago, evangelists were called culpiters and they would they would sell Bibles ever so cheaply and New Testaments uh, to get God's word, the truth into people's hearts and minds. And, you know, one culpiter, he used to have a, a barrow with these New Testaments and Bibles and he had a little sign. He was obviously a great on, entrepreneur and his little slogan was, Satan trembles when he sees Bibles sold as cheap as these. We get the truth into our hearts. We get the truth to our friends and neighbours. We are begotten again by the word of truth. Then there's a third aspect of the coming of the Holy Spirit to us, and that is his indwelling. His indwelling. Verse 17, again, the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives within you and will be in you. And I could repeat verse after verse, and we could look at many more verses to underline this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12, uh, where we, we read, sorry, verse 16. Do you not know, says Paul, that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit and God's Spirit lives in you? The life of God in Stephen Carter. The life of God in Carl Hutchins. The life of God in Pat Jones. The life of God in Kim and so on. What a wonderful thing. The Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people, but not within them. Now the Holy Spirit comes within the child of God, the indwelling. Wow. Well, two things we can note. First is the privilege of the Holy Spirit. I've, I've indicated that already, haven't I? And I trust you can testify, like D.L. Moody testified, the evangelist of a previous century. And he knew the Lord. He was indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but 
he realized that the Holy Spirit, you can know more and more of him. There's that initial filling and then you go on being filled. And, and so he spent some time seeking a further outpouring of the Holy Spirit and it came to him. And he just flooded his soul. And eventually he had to say, Lord, stop. My body, you know, can't take much more. Maybe you've had a touch of that. You've been ecstatic with joy. Well, remember, he went out onto Boston Common and he said, the sun was shining just for me. And the birds seemed to be singing just for me. And I could take all men, even my enemies, to my heart. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the indwelling. But then, of course, there's a privilege uh, is linked to the responsibility. He comes to live within us, to indwell. Now, I don't know about your house, but, you know, if we have any visitors, you know, we're on our best behaviour. When they go, well, maybe that's a different thing. We try our best, but he comes to indwell. But he comes to indwell, verse 17 tells us, forever. He's the permanent guest. And all oh, that I would realise it more because someone living with you all the time, and especially the Holy Spirit, must change the way you and I live. And of course he does. And we delight in it. We're being changed from one stage of glory to another. But how is it with you? How is the progress in lockdown? Do you find that almost the last thing you do with all this time is read the truth? Do you find that you're not as aware of the Holy Spirit as you ought? I, I don't challenge you to depress you. I challenge you to encourage you. He's living within me and my life must willingly change. When we bought our first house, £28,500 for a terraced house, it seemed a phenomenal, phenomenal sum then. The, orange, the, the bedroom was orange, the doors throughout were purple and most of the walls were a lime green. It reflected the previous owners. By the time we left, they were polka dot, they were pink. They, no, I tell a joke. No, the house reflected our taste because we live there. And people should see that our demeanor, our language, our lifestyle, all of it reflects the indwelling of the owner of the house, the blessed Holy Spirit. And if I can just apply this, because it's been a challenge and yet a blessing to my own heart. Those of us who use the notes, um, the explore notes, you know, we've been going through one John and you have this exhortation that we are to sin not. We are to walk in the light. So here we have it. Chapter 2, 1 John, verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. He is something great. The Apostle John in an ideal world doesn't want any of God's children to sin. He wants a radical change. He knows we will sin, but the exhortation is, don't sin. As far as in possible lies in you, don't sin. So my challenge, the challenge that came to me is, when I wake up in the morning, do I say to myself, Lord, help me not to sin? And why should I do that? Well, it's an exhortation from God's word. But also, John's thinking is this, he wants us to walk in the light. And the more that we are not consciously sinning, the more we'll enjoy the light of God's fellowship. Now, don't misunderstand me. 
but I trust you see what a revolution it might be to your life and mine. If instead of saying, oh, well, I'm going to sin anyway, so our resistance becomes very, very feeble. And we get on this treadmill of, oh, I've sinned again, and I confess again, and I sin again. You know, let's have a little bit of backbone. Do you remember that prayer meeting where this man used to say, Lord, that the spider of sin has, has, has woven the sins in my life, and oh, I'm so sorry that this spider has kept on weaving sins. And eventually, he uh, said it one week, the next week, ten weeks later, he's still bemoaning the spider of sin. And eventually, a fellow believer in prayer said, God, kill the spider. <laughs> kill the spider. Let's walk in the light. Well, I'm going to break my promise of 35 minutes. What else does the Holy Spirit bring? He brings peace. An inner peace, verse 27, whatever the circumstances. Uh, let me just take another few more minutes, will you? But I was reading this book, a secular book, about an Australian newscaster who is of the status of a John Humphreys newsreader. And uh, he got Emmy. Well, Linda's got Emmy, so I thought I'd read it. And uh, imagine my surprise and delight. His consultant says to him, He's, he's, he's gone from being a public figure to three plus years of absolute chronic fatigue with all the depression that comes with it. And his consultants asked how I felt in myself, how I was coping with this major upheaval in my life. This is what he said by way of reply. This was something of a paradox, despite significant physical suffering and great uncertainty, frustration and distress, I actually felt a strong sense of confidence, purposefulness and security. The basis of this was my conviction that whatever was going on in my body, God was still in control of my life and circumstances and working for my good. How wonderful. I didn't expect that. Here is a believer coping with chronic fatigue. And the peace comes from knowing that God is in control of his life. That's what the Holy Spirit brings. If you have the time, look at Acts 2 and you'll see that that's what happens as the Spirit is poured out. But I'm going to take you further. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? Well, we're told, if you love me, keep my commandments. I'll ask the Father, he'll give you another advocate. You've got to love God. That will lead to keeping his commands. That will lead to receiving the Holy Spirit. You say to me, Steve, but I don't really love God. Well, that's good of you to be honest. Because it's lack of love to God that stops you believing, that in turn stops you receiving. Let me then close with this illustration. It's only relevant in terms of my generation. But here goes. A man falls in love with a woman. He likes her, gets to know more of her, and feels, yes, yeah, she's the one for me. But he's aware of that saying, the saying that goes, love is blind, marriage is the eye opener. So he knows he's going to have to take a step of faith and ask the girl, if he doesn't ask, he won't receive. So he does ask, because there's another saying, isn't there? Faint heart never won, fair lady. So he asks. She says yes. And 40 years down the line, I'm so glad I didn't miss the opportunity of that relationship and all the joy that it's brought. Will you win Jesus? Faint heart won't win it. Fair Jesus. Will you take that step of faith and ask God to give you his Holy Spirit, to forgive you your sins? May it be so that this Pentecost for some of you, 
there'll be the initial receiving of the Holy Spirit. And for many of us, there'll be a further filling of the Holy Spirit. For his name's sake. Amen.